So welcome as ever to everybody uh, on Tuesday morning, at least in, in, in California. Uh, for those of you who uh, were or are still up to date with some of the emails that were going around, one of the things that people wanted to talk today was uh, GPS options. So a couple of us um, stepped forward with some great suggestions for uh, either show and tell or conversation topics. And I think it makes sense uh, to put the first two volunteers uh, together up front. So Kyle, I can see you're online. Did you want to let us know what was uh, worth describing or discussing? And then after that, we can move into Brendan. Unless, of course, Kyle, you're not quite ready, in which case I think Brendan probably is. Yeah, I, I think Brendan should have helmet. I just really had the idea that GPS might be something that um, would be a really useful tool for what we're up to. Great. Uh, Brendan, you said you had some slides. Are they ready to show you? Sure. Let me. Um, well, I actually don't have slides. I just kind of wanted to talk through um, how we at uh, Panini have been using uh, location and then talk about um, some of the other applications that I've seen in the marketplace. Um, I, I've been on the advisory board for uh, Pickpocket Labs, which has a fascinating application using uh, geofence um, uh, content aggregation uh, to, for event management. And this enables some really interesting uh, use cases, both for um, news and um, shared um, uh, video and reporting. Uh, we, lots of event management around uh, uh, the World Cup a few years ago. Um, and we'll talk more about that. And I can go into what that technology looks like. Uh, for a few years now, a couple of years now, I've been following uh, foam.spaces. Uh, and foam has got a really novel um, uh, application where they're using um, uh, they're, they're using stations other than uh, that are not GPS to track and uh, deliver uh, location services. And whenever we think about um, uh, events and ticketing, um, as I've spent quite a bit of time uh, thinking about those things um, for uh, Panini's mobile apps, the ha having uh, um, a date stamp, a public date stamp of when you were at a location is actually really important. And, and it's important whether you're uh, running, operating drones that are snapping pictures of pipelines and, you know, do, uh, or observing uh, construction sites or monitoring um, environmental, uh, um, uh, uh, other environments. But you also, uh, when, when you um, get that location, at least in the context of blockchain technology, that location, um, that unforgeable location becomes really, really important to connect with uh, the assets, uh, what, whatever those assets are, if they're graphic assets, whether it's a, uh, a attendance or proof that you attended somewhere or that uh, an actual uh, media was captured somewhere, um, having a, uh, a location that's not spoofable that you can actually uh, tie to a blockchain uh, really enhances the value and the integrity of whatever it is you're doing. So there's lots of applications of that. And then finally, there's the um, um, proof of attendance protocol. I have not studied that one. Uh, I, I looked at that when they came out, and it looks like the project's made some uh, interesting headway in delivering badges, and they have their own mobile app. Uh, but I, I can easily see uh, where uh, different badging and and how we can create and enhance um, uh, events and the, the experiences with uh, 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 real life experiences, real life events and attendance with um, uh, you know that type of uh, technology and offering NFTs in connection with events. So anyway, that's just kind of a, a rough overview of, of the things that I, I wanted to uh, talk about. If we um, Unfortunately, I don't have the um, um, what I need to display the uh, Panini uh, uh, Blitz app. But Panini has several. Uh, we have three different digital trading card mobile apps. They're mobile free-to-play apps. Um, 
you collect free coins by attending and uh, or by opening the app and participating. And inside these apps, you can open packs of cards. These are digital only cards. They're not on the blockchain at this time. They're, they're not NFTs at this time. Um, however, the, the platform was engineered four years ago to support uh, that with atomic uh, uh, digital assets. So uh, we like how we're positioned in that space. But these digital collectibles, um, you can collect the cards. And what we've done is we've created an augmented reality environment, very much uh, like Pokemon Go, where, and we call it Card Hunter. And so there's several mini games within these mobile apps. Um, and in these mini games, we can, um, uh, we, we've generated uh, collectible uh, card content, trading card content. These are officially licensed with the NFL, the NBA, and uh, FIFA. And so you can find the cards, you can locate them, and you can orient towards them, walk to them, and collect them. Of course, it gets um, that uh, we have not implemented, but we could in the context of geofences. Um, if we use geofences, say, at a, um, uh, an event like a, a stadium, for example, and people that are, are um, uh, in attendance at the stadium would have exclusive access to content uh, and collectible content that's only found in the stadium. And we really like that use case. It, it creates, uh, it makes the, your presence uh, at, at a stadium e even more valuable. And of course, everyone's um, in, the, in the sports and entertainment industry is looking to enhance value in, in that sort of way. So this is, this is how we're thinking about it. This is the kind of thing that we're doing. Um, Let's see, I can share my uh, screen. Let's see. Bear with me. Okay, so what we're looking at now is um, the, the uh, uh, Google Play Store where we've got NFL Blitz. And unfortunately, I, like I said, I can't show it to you, but you can get an idea of how the, the cards, this is a, you see a, a picture. I'm sorry if that's small, but there's basically we are opening packs. Uh, it simulates the a pack opening process and users can um, uh, use this in different ways. And of course, we've got different mini games that have like a fantasy component, a player versus player component. Now, those are interesting in their own right, but location services that are offered um, again, can be connected uh, uh, to the app and offer it and, you know, create an interesting uh, use case where we're adding value to different uh, uh, locations. Of course, all these assets we'd like to see as NFTs and on the blockchain. Uh, uh, moving on to um, uh, Pickpocket Labs, you can see there, uh, uh, they've got an app in the, uh, uh, both of the stores. It's, um, They've really gone after a social uh, a social media opportunity, but they've got um, some apps where all of your uh, the content can be aggregated. So imagine, if you will, you can set up a uh, a geofence uh, along a parade route, and people that are in the parade can take pictures, and they can be aggregated. Uh, Using different, you know, uh, content aggregation techniques um, that are have emerged over the last few years, you can curate and deliver uh, fantastic uh, video montages. You can actually um, uh, use um, facial recognition and extract really um, uh, uh, these video montages and feature uh, particular people, perhaps the users of the apps. And again, I'm. Just kind of covering the space, we'll tie it back into the, uh, um, the, the, the larger world of, of um, this SIG, whereas when we think about the, uh, both the location and when that's really, really important, we want that secured on a blockchain and the, the content that is, uh, can be offered and connected and created as NFTs um, uh, conveys a lot of, of value. And so the intersection of uh, location, whether we think of it as a point 
or as a, uh, uh, a boundary on a map. Um, there's also, uh, we have geospaces, which are volumetric. Um, and, you know, that can, that can uh, matter in a lot of different ways, um, depending on, you know, what floor you're on. One, a lot of people don't realize that the current accuracy of your, your mobile phone is um, with the next generation of phones is uh, within 18 inches, um, which is astonishing. Um, I mean, that, that is a really high level of resolution and creates a lot of possibilities. Um, and just uh, uh, kind of an aside, but um, on the, the uh, uh, email thread that came up, there was a talk about privacy and I'm over here talking about uh, facial recognition and content curation and other things. And so uh, I just want everyone to know that I'm, I'm all about privacy. Um, and it, it seems to me that at least in the web 2.0 world, privacy was the, one of the first casualties in commercializing um, you know, that stack of technologies. And what we have is an opportunity to uh, change that and, and devolve power back to uh, users and individual and how they control their information. I'm very, uh, I'm extremely present and focused to that and all the apps that we're creating and how we imagine the, the standards and, and, and the future we want to create here. So and I would invite everyone here uh, to think, think about it and, and make that an important part of uh, your strategy, because that's something that we as a people, have, I think, have to stand for. I mean, we've got to stand strong for it. Uh, or we're going to end up with a lot of compromises and a lot of standards that lead us away from this, you know, opportunity um, to, to control our privacy in a new and really important way. So I, I know it's a lot off topic, but I really wanted to, to put that out there. It's something that's a, really important to me. Um, let's see. So with, with um, uh, yeah, th there's another technology here with Pickpocket uh, that goes into ghosting that requires um, uh, location, location services. Uh, so imagine you've got a photo that was taken in a particular location. Um, that photo can, can live in that location, so to speak, and services can be uh, emerged that actually allow the, the photo to be overlaid and viewed. Uh, you could go to a particular uh, uh, destination and you could see all the other photos. You could uh, see the selfies people could curate lists of the people who have been there with you. There's obviously, again, lots of possibilities for montages and other ways to, to curate and deliver a unique experience. Again, all enabled using location, location services and the, the power of uh, uh, NFTs. So let's see, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, we, can, we can talk about the, the foam network um, and again, th this is, we've got, got uh, uh, several different things happening with the foam network and I don't want to cover it all, but the, 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 the point is that there are, um, uh, the centralized platforms and services that are emerging, um, that people creating experiences and, uh, trying to manage collectability and other things connected with this web 3.0 stack uh, can use and connect into to, to engineer some really novel experiences, things that, that, um, uh, that haven't emerged yet are going to be really, really exciting. I've been talking about the things that we've seen, but I think um, especially uh, in the next uh, few years, we've, uh, because of all the converged uh, technology, there's some really exciting uh, uh, experiences that can be en engineered using um, NFTs and um, the, the, the um, uh, spatial and, and location, location data. And then we, um, we mentioned uh, Pope. This is just one example. I consider this a really um, uh, narrow um, uh, implementation, but basically you're creating a badge, an NFT and it is uh, connected to spatial data so that you can uh, prove that you have attended somewhere. And, you know, 
when we think about the, the different ticketing uh, platforms that people are engineering today, um, those are really, really exciting. I, I think they create a whole new dimension to um, uh, for the entertainment uh, industry. Certainly, uh, yeah, I'm operating primarily in the um, uh, in the, the, the sports uh, uh, industry. And we're, we're looking at it very closely on, uh, again, how we deliver um, uh, content, how, how we can uh, create loyalty. And we think about uh, loyalty in a lot of different ways. But when you've got uh, products like Panini's, there's collectibles. Uh, those, are, um, th those are definitely uh, uh, goods where other people, other industries that are adjacent to ours, People have only so much discre uh, discretionary time and discretionary uh, funds to allocate to their interests. And collectibles are one of those. And to the extent that we can create really compelling um, experiences and, and build off of all of the, uh, the licenses and the value that uh, the rest of the industry creates through their properties, whether it's a sports uh, or other entertainment enterprise, um, we, we want to create really compelling experiences that are engaging because the, the dollars we're capturing uh, commercially can go, they can go other places, right? People can, they don't have to buy trading cards, for example. They don't have to buy NFTs. You know, they can, um, uh, they, they can buy um, experiences at a restaurant. They can buy other physical goods like memorabilia and helmets and jerseys and those sorts of things. And the more dollars that they're spending elsewhere, the less dollars they're, they're spending with us. And I, I know this is obvious, but when we think about um, the licenses that we acquire, creating that, um, that uh, engagement and that connection with, um, with collectors um, is key because we, they, they are motivated. They're passionate about the subject. We've got content um, that connects them to, to their subjects of interest, whether it's a player or a team, whether it's a stadium, you know, wh wherever they are, we, we have an opportunity um, at the intersection of these technologies to create um, really compelling and engaging experiences for them to actually um, uh, consume our content. I mean, the Panini's a, a content engine. You know, we're, we're creating content. We create hundreds of thousands of unique designs um, with these licensed properties. And um, if we look at the entertainment industry as a, as a content industry, you know, they're at, at least abstracted like that, their, their objectives are, are very much in line with ours. And what's also exciting is uh, the entertainment industry um, as well as the gaming industry, both um, li like the collectibles industry we're in, they're engaging users for, for long spans of time. I mean, uh, hours, you know, the, 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 with, with the primary asset, and again, in, in the license category, you know, whether it's, it's, it's the movie, okay, that you've watched three times or four times, you've got hours in it. If it's a game and you spent 40 hours with it, you, you're really connected to that uh, um, in, in a way that under other industries and other consumer um, uh, services or products, just they, they don't have that level of engagement, so we're operating um, in a, in a in a world that it's it's a pretty big, um, well, it's a huge design space for for NFTs and location services, and I'll I'll stop there. I don't know that I had a lot more to, to add than that, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, do we have any questions? I've got an interesting question. <clears throat> So Apple has recently come out with AirTags. Has any, anybody familiar with that? Um, when you think about what it is, it's similar to a tile, right? But it's actually a little bit different. Uh, and when you think about the whole aspect of uh, providing an identity to a thing, this is exactly what Apple is doing, but it is allowing the consumer to provide an identity, a digital twin, to anything that it wants to by uh, putting the 
the air tag near the object or attached somehow to the object. Um, and it would seem such a simple novel thing, but actually they're using UWB technology. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody has uh, advanced knowledge of UWB, but it's quite an interesting protocol. Uh, it has the op ability to replace Bluetooth, NFC, possibly, possibly even Wi-Fi in some aspects. Um, but the real key is it gives an identity to something that uh, traditionally um, didn't have an identity to you, but you create your own hub and you create your own identity. And my goodness, that seems to be uh, the way to um, eventually add it to the blockchain. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about here? Yeah, and I was going to add, I was on a, 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 a Twitter spaces last night with some folks, some analysts, and uh, Robert Scoble, I don't know if you know what Scoble is, but talking about what Apple's doing with that, Apple and uh, Google are basically creating like a 3D model of space and assigning an address, right? So now when you've clicked that tile in space, that address has a, a, a three-dimensional location in the big database that they're building of everything, right? Right. It, it so kind makes of like the, the next level beyond. It, it, it basically makes the imagery. iPhone, right. It, may, it basically makes the iPhone, the owner of the iPhone, the actual, um, the hub of the, the network. But uh, nevertheless, the, all those identities and IDs uh, would be very difficult to track. I mean, very difficult to, to manage unless you used the blockchain. Uh, so I, I, I see that this is another very cool and interesting technology that has kind of, uh, has kind of had the sleeper moment and, and come in. And people don't realize the significance of what Apple did. Uh, I think it's quite significant. Uh, and I guess maybe, um, <clears throat> maybe I think in, in the future, UWB technology um, could quite honestly be used uh, for, for COVID-19 contact tracing, actually, to be honest. Anyway, that's, that's off topic. That's off topic. But I just wanted to get the, the engines flowing, the minds generating, because uh, you guys are the engineers. I'm just the guy with the, with the, the vision. Uh, Vipin, you had your hand up. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? So a couple of things. Uh, you said, Brendan, that uh, you were interested in privacy as well. So I was wondering what exactly uh, the solutions are, because we have to think about this before we put anything out there. Uh, because if you if you do not, then you're going to get people a lot of pushback. You're going to get, you know, all run into all sorts of problems. So that's you know, I mean, everybody pays it uh, lip service. It's very difficult to do uh, this, uh, as you know. Differential privacy is a very difficult concept, or, and that is only for aggregations, but. Uh, if it is not aggregations, then you know there has to be some other way of dealing with it. I don't know how AirTags handles that, but that's you know all, all of these uh, things that expose our location. Yeah. Uh, um, actually, Apple's relying on their, their you know stance on trust and privacy, right? But uh, there's already people uh, writing that uh, they are only um, you know basically that. It is not really private because you got to you got to expose it to attack. Otherwise, you'll never find where you know what the weaknesses in the system are. Um, the uh, the other thing is uh, you know we we already carry with us this uh, location services, meaning uh, the phones are like electronic anklet bracelets, you are actually wearing one uh, and uh, it tracks, it, it connects to the local cell tower every so many few minutes and it stores all that data. So I think the, the, the point is that the uh, cell, cell phone companies do not actually need this data because they only need it momentarily when you, you know, 
obviously they have to, you have to know where where the phone is in order to uh, route a, a call or a signal to it. Uh, but the frictionless nature of storing all this data and the low cost has made it such that they are storing everything. In fact, you can find out where you were in 19, uh, you know, like 2005 when, you know, when you got your iPhone from, you know, from that point on every 15 minutes, it stores your data. So these kind of things, you know, it's, it's very difficult to um, get around it unless you have some kind of regulation and people get. Well, I don't know about that, Vipin. I, I think um, we have um, with uh, public key cryptography and the uh, decentralized um, blockchain uh, technologies, we, we have the ability um, to preserve a lot of privacy that's been lost. And it starts with the, um, it, it starts with the DID, it starts with a, a, an identity. And there's a lot of really important work being done on in that area. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm uh, actually the chair of the identity working group, and Aries, <laughs> Aries, Aries and Indy were uh, launched from our working group. But okay, uh, the, the main thing is that they never store the any data on the blockchain. Uh, um, yeah. gen gentlemen, I hope I, I don't want to interrupt, but it's oh. really important. It's really important to distinguish what we're really talking about here. When you're operating in the ISM band, right? which is Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi. Uh, NFC has its own encryption, right? But how safe is the NFC encryption? Um, I don't know if it's been spoofed already, but we're talking about UWB. I, I've done some research. This is very, very, uh, um, this, the, the security on UWB is second to none. So uh, I, I think Apple's got something here by using UWB and making the phone the, the, the Internet of Things uh, uh, the hub for the user. And I, all I'm trying to say is, because uh, Apple's already figured this out. You know, we're talking esoteric things. Apple has figured this out. All I'm trying to say is, now, the next thing is, I don't, I don't want to just say Apple has figured it out. So, uh, you know, don't worry about it. Don't worry about yeah, yeah. No, we should pretty little worry head about it. it. That is not uh, an attitude that I would take as a scientist. I would say, okay, let us have the privacy guys attack it. Right, let us right, have right. The, uh, let us have a honest conversation about it. I'm not going to uh, give uh, you know all the props <laughs> to somebody <laughs> who Apple. says, oh, I've I've taken care of this. You don't have to. Care. <laughs> That's I not get, how we work here. I yeah. get your point. I get your. I get so, your, so all I get I'm saying point. is, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> shooting any of this stuff down. I'm. I'm just saying that we have to keep that in mind. And how sure. do we? How do we uh, talk about it? And privacy first. You know, I know that Nathan said. Uh, you know, privacy first is a tough problem, yeah. but we have to uh, really be addressing that uh, as part of our solution. I'm not saying. Uh, don't look at any solutions uh, because it's all going, you know, if you appear in public, you're on some camera somewhere. <laughs> I mean, uh, so yeah, that would be, that would be in Shanghai, China. <laughs> yeah. No, well, no in, England, in the UK too. I mean, really, <laughs> if, you, if you wear, you know, you probably got, got to wear a hijab and go around. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Let's the, let's uh, let's not all jump off the cliff with Apple just because Apple is leading the no, sheep no. off the cliff. I get your point. <laughs> I'm not saying uh, either either way. I'm just saying let us look at this on, honestly and let let us get material on it. Let us uh, look uh, research it and then uh, come up with some uh, stuff uh, along with you know all this stuff that we are excited about UWB sure. and uh, the. Uh, you know, voxel-based uh, geohashing. With, uh... So I can say at Panini, we've made some really specific uh, decisions around privacy. When we implemented our Hyperledger Sawtooth instance, you know, we had the ability to uh, auto-generate or create um, uh, account names uh, 
for users or to use their uh, um, their account name in the clear, we chose not to. We chose to use um, uh, uh, public keys, uh, and that way the the user um, could maintain their privacy if they wanted. You know, one thing to think about when we're talking about uh, NFTs, uh, whether they're um, music or uh, uh, graphic collectibles like uh, Panini makes, what, whatever the NFT is, um, the, the, they are bearer instruments. And, you know, when you've got a six figure portfolio of collectibles or music, um, that's something you don't necessarily want everyone in the world to be able to know about you. Um, and, and so we thought through that and we thought, yeah, we, we need to protect the users because we know that we're going to have users that have really large uh, portfolios of these uh, uh, collectibles. Now, unfortunately, the payment gateway process of platforms um, kind of broke a rather idealistic approach. And until we can uh, uh, implement uh, uh, a different uh, uh, payment gateway that doesn't use uh, conventional public payment rails, um, we, we've, we're not whole, we, we, like we haven't fully defended the consumer's um, uh, privacy, but we certainly made it an important part of how we evaluate and implement our, um, our product uh, and our service. And, and I guess I would just invite everyone else to, to, to think along those lines. I mean, at every point um, in your product development um, process as, as your engineering solutions, you know, th this is one that historically has been dropped and, and we can't drop it. We, we've got to um, uh, be motivated and, and connected to it. And my, so even what we've done is it's imperfect uh, because of how we had to get to market, but it does not have to stay that way. The, the, the platforms and the technology, the payment gateways, they're all emerging that are going to let us protect uh, users' identity and let them be in charge of whether they want to. So on our platform, a user can actually, they can give themselves an alias. Like if they want uh, uh, to be Cooper or Coop out on, on the, 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 the public platform and in the galleries that we manage for people, they can do that. Uh, that's a choice, uh, but it's their choice. It's, it's not a choice we made for them. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm interested as well uh, um, uh, to, to hear if uh, uh, more along the veins of our uh, conversation that we started with on um, uh, location services and, and geospaces. You know, one of the interesting things that we're encountering from a, a copyright standpoint, historically, um, uh, when you were licensing from Disney, or from the NFL or the NBA or you know whoever the the, the large uh, global licensor was, those are ge have historically for physical products. Those have been geographically uh, constrained. So you would get um, you, you would you would license and, and get licenses that were restricted to the U.S. market or the U.S. market with only big box retail stores. Um, and you know you could add on to the list, but um, the NFTs and, and what we're creating with this um, uh, blockchain, to, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not constrained in the same way. And so it's altering the nature of licensing and how do we capture uh, that? And what I see as a possibility, the infrastructure isn't there yet, or maybe it is with Poem, where we could actually constrain and license and restrict distribution by geography using some of these location services. And if I'm a big media and entertainment conglomerate, um, I think that sounds pretty good in, for a lot of different kinds of digital only products because some um, uh, distribution channels and distributors are gonna be a lot more qualified to operate in um, South America than, than someone else. And, and, and historically, if you wanted global rights, you were gonna pay a real premium for that. Um, and in the current um, embodiment of, of NFTs in particular, that's really not, a, it's not, a, not, not possible within the constraints of the NFT standards, but it's certainly emerging. I'd be curious to hear um, anyone's uh, take on that. But if, if I'm a media and entertainment conglomerate, that's something that I'm advocating for in, um, in 
uh, in the standards that, that are emerging around uh, uh, NFT. It's, it's something that I would, I would want to uh, study really hard. So, so if I see an NFT uh, online and I can actually look at it, then I can take my phone and actually take a snapshot of it. Um, I, I now own a legitimate copy of the NFT, which is really could be a photo, could be a baseball card or something. Um, but now I have a complete t- digital twin, uh, which I freely was able. I, I guess what I'm saying is if you can see, view, hear something, um, the end user can somehow reproduce it. So I, um, I wonder about that. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, Carl. I mean, that, that's, a, that's been a, um, that's a well-trod attack against the, the NFT um, and its value in controlling. Uh... NFT does not prevent you uh, from copying anything. I mean, you know. Hello, hello. Sorry, I buzzed out for a minute. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, so uh, yeah, Carl, that that's a, a well-known attack. So yes, uh, virtual files have very little standing in law, except that which it falls under contract law, um, which is normally the terms and conditions or the end user uh, agreement that you sign when you consume virtual property. Um, that notwithstanding, um, you know the 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 market is comfortable with a virtual property being a non-rivalrous good. That is to say, as you say, it can be perfectly and, and, and cheaply or almost freely uh, duplicated. And what the market is saying is, so what? That something, the intersection of the virtual property, okay? And its, its connection to a substrate in this case, a blockchain, okay, that, that that is a unique thing. That is a unique thing that you own. And it's not the same thing as the photo on your phone because you don't have any c- control uh, or connection out on the, 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 the layer or the substrate where the artist or the creator chose to put it. And, and so, you know, you can go to the Louvre and you can take a picture of the Mona Lisa. Do you own it? <laughs> No, it's sitting on a it's sitting on some substrate that's been around for a few hundred years. Hey, and I've I've actually done that. <laughs> so, so, but I mean, you're I, I mean, I understand the the argument, and you know what, what we're what's going to happen is we as a society. I mean, the the law is behind where people's attitudes are about virtual property. People want to own vir- virtual property. They want it to operate like. Uh, uh, physical property, they want control over it, they want to be able to loan it to people, they want liens against it, they want to, there, there's all these things that aren't conferred under most um, law uh, to digital goods, and yet people are embracing that because that's how they think about it, especially digital natives, okay? Digital natives, uh, they, they don't need to be convinced that an NFT is valuable. They accept that, yes, you can get a fo- photo of it, or yes, I can co- right click it and copy the, the file itself, but so what? I've got the version that matters that the creator or the licensor or the licensee actually minted on this public blockchain, which is where you know they say uh, th- this, this is the original, this is it, and they're willing to accept that. So I think the, the law is going to, catch up with that, the technical implementations are rapidly evolving to confer a lot of those attributes. And again, the, the, the blockchain natively, the NFT uh, as, as are written today, natively confer uh, control, but the actual authentication of the, of the, the user or the creator, that, that doesn't exist. The permanent uh, access to the rights and the rights management you know, that infrastructure is, is coming in place so that it's always connected. You know, that's uh, uh, something that uh, Sebastian um, is um, on this call is a, is a world leader in. Um, and so I think, you know, we've got uh, all the technical um, 
improvements that we can make to, to construct a really strong digital property, it, it all exists. It's not widely deployed yet, but it, it exists and it's already strong enough for uh, the market to go from 100 million in NFTs in Q4 of last year and in Q1 of this year, it's about two and a half billion. And we're on pace this month for that to continue. And you know, we can argue whether it's a, a bubble or not, but in two years, we're still gonna be talking about NFTs. The infrastructure is still gonna be rapidly maturing. The standards are gonna be maturing and people want virtual property. They just do. Um, absolutely, absolutely. A couple of, couple of things here. Uh, one is, you know, there's a pure digital property, which is only exists as digital uh, items. Then the other is a digital twin, like, you know, NFTs uh, have been also linked to real estate uh, and other items. So there's, a, 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 that's a different class of NFTs because obviously uh, we have been trading mortgage-backed securities for a long time. And in, in fact, it is nothing but an NFT that has been packaged up into cash flows that are then tradable as securities. It becomes, it transforms an NFT, a group of NFTs into a, um, into a FT, a fungible token. Uh, like a bond, you know. So there is a, you know, there is some sleight of hand that happens that transforms that physical property into something that can be, uh, that are both, you know, secured by contract law. And in fact, uh, there is contract law today that uh, in, in, for trade finance, for example, there's tr contract law that uh, track that is, valid, the digital, digital signatures are valid in uh, Delaware, for example. Um, in fact, there's a whole uh, discussion happening about that in trade finance group, but you know, that is a different, slightly different class of NFTs where there's actual physical representation, there's a cash flow, there is something being produced out of that NFT. The other is the NFT with, you know, like which, which are, Purely, purely digital properties, uh, and you know, so they're they're slightly different in in in, in their underlying. So, I, I think what you're talking about now is here is obviously about the pure digital prop, uh, properties that uh, can be frictionlessly copied and reproduced. And so, you know, it's not even like the Mona Lisa because again, Mona Lisa is a physical object. And you can take a picture of it, but now you're transforming that physical object into a digital object. Obviously, they're not the same, but certain things do exist I, as pure digital objects. So that's. So I've got I, I've got a question because I'm I'm a little confused. When we take the physical object, um, we take it from the physical world, and we I guess take a photo, and that creates the digital twin. So now we've got a digital twin, but we don't have something that actually can be monetized. And I guess the non fungible token is. Is, this, is also a digital twin that can be monetized. Is, is that correct? Because I'm not sure. Uh, I well, don't think you can call it a digital twin. Uh, the uh, other one is a real digital object and there is no digital, there is no physical object. Right. So but kind of elaborating on that theme, Carl, that what we see is, and, and um, uh, Vip and thank you, um, for bringing this up because I, I have been talking about digital only NFTs, uh, but the, you know, when you extend them to NFTs to include and point to physical goods, which is pretty straightforward to do technically with um, uh, anytime you, you, you create, have strong authentication technology um, on a physical good. Okay, in our case, uh, in trading cards, you know, we can think about, um, diamond dust, we can think about high resolution photography, but we can get unique signatures that can only be destructively removed, okay, on, on, onto the good. And at that point, we can actually hash that signal to, um, to the NFT. And so now we've got a virtual representation of the, of the physical thing. And we got the, the NFT that's pointing to the physical thing. 
And that en enables all kinds of new business models. And I'm not sure, and I haven't really spent any time thinking about how it would relate to um, the larger entertainment industry, but for our purposes, we definitely see the possibility of having different custodial arrangements. So if I've got um, uh, possession of physical cards, I'm the manufacturer, I can actually sell them without actually incurring shipping costs. And users don't have to actually pay for shipment. They don't have to go to eBay and move things around. They can just transact the NFT that represents the thing. And you, you're paying maybe some fee for the custodial services, but the thing that you're actually buying is actually in a vault somewhere, carefully controlled, managed, and, and really safe in a way that you probably can't make it safe. And that's an exciting value proposition. We're already seeing some companies standing up. There's some uh, startups that are coming to address that specific need. And it's not just in this category, uh, in the, this collectible category, but it works across the entire supply chain. Um, and, you know, that, so that's powerful. And, and to me, that's where probably most of the value in, in well, non, actually, I don't know. I, I don't know where all the value is going to be created. There, there's a lot of value to be created using this, this technology and the NFTs pointing to physical goods is, is certainly uh, a huge part of that. Brandon, uh, so do you think that uh, Panini's cloud storage, where you store your assets, is, is a key ingredient to the value th uh, that you attach to the trading cards? I mean, if those trading cards were in IPFS, would they garner the same kind of value? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, that's something we're, we're really uh, investigating. So right now we're operating a, a, a private um, uh, blockchain, okay, the Hyperledger Sawtooth instance. And it is, for our purposes, we have control of it. We have backups of it. We have all the digital assets stored um, uh, using uh, traditional cloud services. And, you know, when we start thinking about um, gateways and the ability to go to public infrastructure, um, how do you control that? How do you actually manage it? And right now, I don't think it's properly well, the, the, the current implementations are, are flawed, in my opinion, because IPFS isn't permanent. You don't have people that are, are services that are fully incentivized to maintain the IPFS connection. We've already seen some companies, startup companies, issue uh, digital goods, NFTs um, that failed. And so the NFT is still on the blockchain. You can open your wallet and you actually have um, in, uh, the token, but the, the metadata the, the, the asset that is pointed to from the blockchain to an IPFS location is lost or is failed in some way. And so you no longer have the thing that you really cared about or the thing that you experienced. So this, this storage, the, the notion of storage of uh, virtual goods, there, there are some interesting um, uh, implementations at IPFS that actually uh, support it. But one of them is the, the location of your, um, uh, your, your file, okay? So um, if we think about, especially using uh, the, the types of technology as we're imagining it, uh, and Sebastian could probably tell us more about this, but when we think about the, the actual files that you're getting with your NFT, the thing that you experience and you view, you see, you hear, you know, whatever that is, um, if it's been um, properly hashed through the blockchain, then where the, the actual metadata lives um, isn't as important as the fact that, it, that it's present, that, it, that it's available. Because you can always validate with 100% certainty using the hash, using a hashing technology. In Sebastian's case, you've got a feature preserving hash, which confers a lot of value uh, to that hash. But at the point that you've got a hash on the blockchain connected to the NFT, it's all immutable. So if I have the hash, if you, I'm sorry, if I have the file, you have the file, the file's sitting out in the cloud somewhere, as long as I know where it is, does it matter exactly where it is? And so today we have implementations at NFTs that point to specific file locations. Um, and frankly, I think that's flawed. I think we either need a, a file location oracle or a file location service so that um, if I wanna take charge of it, like if I own the Mona Lisa, um, you know, we know where to find it. 
uh, we know if they've got, you know, they, they know whether they've got one in, in they want to put it in the basement and whatever art I own, I have control of it. And I, sometimes I give other people custody of it. So they have control of it. And I think that's very sensible. And I think those that, uh, similar models uh, could and probably should prevail in this digital world. Um, and there's the, again, the standards just need to emerge. We have the technologies. So does that, does that answer the question, Mohammed? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that does. Uh, but I think a key element would be to attach an identity to the hash, you know, so the hash can be in the blockchain for sure. And, you know, multiple peoples can have a copy of the actual asset and they can claim that they own it, right? So there has to be a way and there are, you know, to attach identity to that hash. Well, that's, that's, what a, that's what the wallet is about. That's yeah. why you have an yeah. Ethereum wallet. That yeah. is the part that is the identity piece. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's definitely... Uh, the value yeah. of the wallet is the KYC that goes into creating it, right? You can right. create your own wallet, um, but you can also involve a third party or other parties in the creation of the wallet. But at the same point, you know, it's, that's the identity piece, right? Well, you collect you you collect the data of the of the incident, the this the change of state of something, right? I'm talking about the IoT world, and then you pass it uh, to create the identity before uh, it even reaches the cloud, before it reaches the blockchain. That's where the security can be. Uh, co that's where the consensus can be arrived because you're collecting it at the at the source of uh, of uh, of occurrence. So that's. Uh, I think I, I get exactly what you're both saying, but I, I'm just saying that you need to. If you're going to stop any kind of uh, malicious activities, you've got to do it at the edge, at the source. That's what my company does. Anyway, I'm jumping back off. That's governance, right? I mean, you have you're pushing the the gateway to governance to the edge of the network, so you have to make sure that yes, yes, all adhere yes. to a standard, and that's why you have a consensus yep. mechanism to make sure that everyone's you know agreeing to that standards been adhered to. Um, I have a couple of points that I'd like to make. If that's possible. Uh, yeah. So um, when I go to my gym, um, I go to the locker and I put a quarter in. I put my bag in there, and then I get a key. Uh, so I can think of that key like a non-fungible token. So as much as we're thinking of non-fungible tokens as, as art, we can also just view them as just straight up keys, just a whole another form, right? Yeah. And then the other point is um, the asset we're pointing to, they're all existing assets, but um, we can also think about potential assets. So for instance, if somebody goes to an event, um, then they get the right to access all the merch that was part of that music event. So that merch doesn't exist yet, perhaps. That merch could be made to order, uh, but because they have the key, which is the non-fungible token, they can go and they can order that. So we don't have to think about pre-existing stuff. It can be stuff that the person has the ability to make in the future with their NFT. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Uh, so to summarize and maybe get back to what the SIG wants to do, you know, there's there seems to be a lot of interesting technologies out there for geotagging and fencing, and there are privacy concerns that are very valid. The question is, do we want to prioritize geotagging uh, in the SIGS agenda right now, or is it something that comes down the road? So I'm thinking purely in terms of an MVP here, you know, for, for the uh, music, uh, you know, assets blockchain or media asset blockchain and NFTs. So, so I think, yeah, a little bit focusing on that point would be of interest. Okay, considering that it's about two minutes to 10, why don't we actually make that the main point for next time? Mm -hmm. So that we've discussed loads of really cool ideas. I've had a great insight into some technologies about like ghosting about which I didn't know that much at all. And we can decide uh, which, if any, we want to include in the short term and then which we can maybe include in, in the midterm as things that are doable, but maybe would sort of muddy the waters a little bit right now. One of the things we did, and I'd mentioned the healthcare working group is when we got organized, we kind of did a survey of the group and asked some questions and did feedback sort of as a group to figure out where to steer things because there's a lot of directions you can go with, with this problem space, but it is you know finding a consensus around you know what are low hanging fruit problems or problems that we share collectively. 
and then one of the other things you couple with that too is potentially an industry survey like what other technology is out there oh, absolutely like what we want to do and then i've also gone and got industry analysts to come and talk to the group like i did that around the healthcare blockchain stuff so and i know that there's some industry like i watched the jeffries did a an nft summit last week but we you know i've got some connections i'm sure other folks here and uh, do have industry connections where we can have one or two um analysts come in and sort of pr present a lay of the land to help contextualize what we're doing as a group right if you have some suggested names that's always great yeah any any please any uh, suggestions yeah. and, and i'm happy to chat with you you know offline or whatever about trying to pull that together um i may even have some uh some or i'm sure hyperledger has some leftover artifacts over in the healthcare working group that we can dust off and repurpose or something so that sounds great. That sounds like I me. Mean, I've just made a note to myself. So what I'll do is I'll draw up a questionnaire um, to find out what people think is doable, or if they're not able to do it themselves, what they think is just thematically yep. most important. Google form, collect everything, exactly. report it back. Um, Maybe share up some responsibilities or find out what people feel they're best suited to do. And then that'll also help us to filter out which of all these very attractive ideas is the most manageable in the short term. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Fantastic. Thank you very much for, for wrapping things up in such a wonderful way, because we're now 22 seconds over time. So that was very well done indeed. <laughs> okay, so thanks as ever to Sebastian, because he, I think, is the person with the worst time. Um, I don't, Sebastian, there's nobody further east than you, I think, at the moment, correct? Not, not this week. Next week uh, will be a terrible timing. Well, ne ne next time it's different. Exactly. Exactly. Then it's, just, then it's, <laughs> it's in the middle of the it's night. It's in the... Yeah with a tough working week. Okay, so thanks very much to everybody. I'll synthesize all of this, send out a, uh, well, a synthesis or a synopsis of what we talked about, and then we'll decide which of these ideas we wanna um, jump into uh, in concrete terms at the next session. Good. Okay, thanks, thanks very much for all of your time. Thanks. thanks. Okay, thank bye. You.